our uh, the objectives of our session um, will focus on good practices that address the challenge surrounding the incorporation of risk reduction in, exist in existing land use uh, planning and management practices at the local level, and also put forward practical recommendations on how to ensure the local government have access to the information, tools, and capacity, uh, capacities necessary to develop and implement risk-sensitive land use uh, planning. So uh, saying that, I'm going to give the voice to uh, the other uh, co-chair. Uh, Dan, you have uh, the voice. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Rolando, and good morning to everybody. <coughs> um, if I understand there was a little bit of a mix-up at the front door, so if anybody's here looking for a session on cultural heritage, it's in the next room. This one is on land and spatial planning for disaster risk reduction. Um, I'm very happy to be able to introduce to you today the four speakers and the, uh, the discussants. I'll do it one at a time in the order of their presentations. And we will be opening up the floor for discussion and dialogue at the, con at the conclusion of, uh, of the presentations today. So <coughs> if you have questions, please be patient. We'll recognize uh, questions from the floor towards the end of the presentation. But to start our, uh, our panel today, let me first introduce to you Dr. Uh, Roberto Morris, the director of the city's observatory, University of Chile professor of the School of Architecture and Urban Studies of the University of Chile and principal investigators of SIGEDEN, National Center for Research in Integrated Natural Disaster Management. Roberto. Thank you, Dan. Tengo una presentación. Ok. Buena, buenos días. Eh, como dijo Dan, eh, yo participo en un centro de investigación multidisciplinario en que eh, somos 60 investigadores eh, que pretendemos generar in investigación y conocimiento sobre la eh, gestión integrada de desastres naturales. Lo que voy a mostrarles es una experiencia que hemos desarrollado en el norte de Chile. Adelante. Adelante. Primero, como contexto, una de las cosas importantes en Chile es que eh, el modelo de desarrollo que hemos tenido, lo que ha pretendido es eh, generar eh, desarrollo económico y disminución de la, de la pobreza, lo cual ha sido muy importante y para ello la provisión de vivienda ha sido un elemento fundamental. Pero para ese modelo ha sido también necesario tener una débil planificación. Cuando pensamos en la manera de cómo gestionar mejor nuestro territorio, tenemos que asumir que estas debilidades de planificación son un elemento estructural que debemos abordar. Si bien Chile tiene una, una cultura muy importante eh, en lo que son los aspectos sísmicos eh, y que nuestra capacidad de respuesta eh, ha sido muy, muy valiosa, eh, muy bien considerada, ustedes pueden ver el esquema de abajo ahí, como a los tres meses después del terremoto del año 2010, un terremoto 8.8, el país logró reconstituirse. Sin embargo, eh, respecto a lo que es la recuperación, eh, lo que es la mitigación y la preparación, aún estamos bastante atrasados. Así que lo que, lo que les voy a mostrar es un ejemplo que, en el cual hemos estado trabajando, que denominamos eh, modelo de planificación integrada paramétrico, en el cual intentamos eh, sumar una serie de elementos eh, a la gestión local, eh, que ustedes pueden ver ahí que, cuáles son los elementos fundamentales. Esencialmente, eh, como centro de investigación, lo que nos interesa es estar trabajando los territorios en periodos eh, extendidos, no solamente llegar y participar en la etapa de la respuesta. Para ello hemos desarrollado este modelo basado en nuestras experiencias anteriores y que en el caso de Atacama, que es el caso que les voy a mostrar ahora, es especialmente importante ya que se desarrolló eh, hubo un, un evento en el año 2005 y mientras está, 2015 perdón, y mientras estábamos trabajando en el territorio acaba de venir otro evento hace dos semanas atrás. Adelante. Uno de los, muchas gracias. Eh, 
lo fundamental para nosotros es asumir la realidad en la que estamos viviendo. Una de las cosas fundamentales es que eh, estamos viviendo realmente un nivel de concentración de eventos eh, muy intenso en los últimos 10 años. Ustedes pueden ver entre el año 60 y el año 2005 tuvimos eventos de distinto tipo cada cuatro años, sin embargo, el último tiempo hemos tenido cada diez meses. Eso significa que eh, la, ya los desastres no son una excepción, sino que es una situación permanente. Al mismo tiempo, esto ha generado que los, los equipos eh, de, de gobierno han tenido que enfrentar de manera eh, muy cercana eh, estos distintos eventos, por lo tanto, se ha generado un proceso de aprendizaje sobre cómo estamos nosotros entendiendo el ciclo de la de, de la gestión de riesgo y por lo tanto tenemos que avanzar hacia estas otras fases más allá de la respuesta. En ese sentido, lo, la experiencia de Japón ha sido muy importante para nosotros, donde eh, la, 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 la importancia que tiene la memoria dentro de lo que es su modelo de gestión de riesgo, donde la preparación de la comunidad está basada en tomar conciencia de lo que son las distintas amenazas en su territorio y cómo incluso también, como el caso que podemos ver ahí, la misma proceso de intervención de distintas mitigaciones posibles se transforma en un laboratorio de distintas eh, soluciones, pero al mismo tiempo también como un espacio educativo. Uno de nuestros casos más relevantes que nos ha permitido ya llevar siete años haciendo seguimiento del proceso del caso de Treyú, una, una, una localidad muy pequeña en el sur de Chile que el año 2010 fue afectada por el terremoto y tsunami, donde se logró desarrollar este modelo de apoyo directamente a los municipios con algunos donantes eh, eh, distintos al propio municipio y al Estado. Eh, esta, esta trabajo de apoyo al, al municipio eh, ha derivado en una serie de proyectos que ya el, el año pasado se logró eh, construir este eh, parque costero de mitigación. Eh, nosotros lo consideramos relevante ya que la mayoría de los recursos se han ido en general en los procesos de reconstrucción se van a los, a, los, a, los, a los municipios más poderosos con mayor apoyo político. Sin embargo, esto es un municipio que no tiene este apoyo político. Es por eso que hemos, de, hemos considerado que este modelo, eh, se, se, lo, 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 lo que tiene son estos estas dispositivos ortopédicos que en el fondo es qué es lo que necesita la gestión local para poder realmente equiva, equi, eh, ponerse en cierto de equivalencia con otros municipios que tienen mucho más apoyo. En el caso de Atacama, que son estas dos eh, localidades de Chañaral y Diego Almagro, que están localizadas en el desierto más árido del mundo, el año 2015 tuvimos un, un, una aluvión que se concentró en la montaña con una gran cantidad de, de lluvia, 50 milímetros en, en tres días, lo cual es, es más o menos un periodo de recurrencia cada 100 años eh, en, en la zona. Sin embargo, eh, hace dos semanas también tuvimos otro evento que fue costero y que afectó a las, eh, directamente a la ciudad. Esto ha sido muy interesante para poder ver cómo eh, eh, los, los modelos teóricos de, 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 de modelación de, de, de amenazas pudieran ser chequeados en un, en un corto plazo. Si bien el impacto eh, de, la, de este evento fue menor que el anterior, ya que se había destruido gran parte de las zonas que estaban mal localizadas, eh, también ha significado un mayor impacto en lo emocional y en lo político. De ahí a que nuestro modelo se plantea eh, esencialmente como un instrumento político y no solo técnico de diálogo entre las autoridades locales, la comunidad y los distintos sectores que participan en la, en la reconstrucción. Ahí podemos ver a la izquierda el plan de reconstrucción generado rápidamente el año 2010, el 2015, en que reorientaría el desarrollo de la ciudad y el proceso que se está desarrollando hoy día de zonificación y definición de obras de mitigación. Aquí es donde está el, el diagrama en el que, de, del modelo que estamos planteando, donde eh, hoy día lo más relevante, el instrumento más importante es la zonificación eh, de lo que se denomina el plan regulador, sin embargo, otras acciones como las inversiones de, de mitigación y todo lo que son los procesos de apoyo socioeconómico son elementos que están dispersos en el sistema. Por eso el, este modelo plantea el apoyo directo al municipio en, en un periodo de largo plazo, sin financiamiento del propio municipio, eh, las, eh, un sistema de seguimiento con un sistema de, de, de 
de infra, eh, sistema de, de datos, perdón, un, una infraestructura de datos espaciales desarrollada a nivel local en open source para el municipio, pero que al mismo tiempo dialoga con el resto del sistema del país para poder tener un proceso de seguimiento y por sobre todo un, un, un modelo de desarrollo prospectivo que estamos desarrollando y que se ha podido eh, eh, desarrollar en, otro, en otras localidades, pero esta sería la primera vez que se puede desarrollar en una eh, experiencia de reconstrucción. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, Roberto. Um, this presentation is illustrating one of the thematic areas of this panel, which is involving the, 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 the close involvement and the commitment to the scientific and technical community in supporting local governments as well as the need to involve civil society and the private sector in the, uh, in the development and monitoring of effective land use plans and policies. You can see that in, in the presentation from Chile, the, the, the importance of setting up this comprehensive, integrated, parametric uh, planning model that focuses on the regulatory framework, that focuses on the development and design uh, elements, that focuses on financing and investment for delivery, and that is, dr is driven by crisis as an opportunity to initiate change. And I think this is a very important principle that we'll hear more and more uh, over the course of this particular presentation, or this set of presentations. And to continue the topic uh, in this vein, but to take it slightly in a slightly different direction, I'd like to introduce now Dr. Miho O'Hara, who's a senior research at the International Center for Water Hazard and Risk Management, and also an adjunct adjunct associate professor of disaster management program of National Graduate Institute for Poli Policy Studies in Japan. She has a PhD in disaster risk reduction planning from the University of Tokyo, Japan. Dr. O'Hara. Thank you, Dan. I'm Miho Hara. Today, I would like to talk on risk-based land use and spatial planning. First of all, I will briefly explain our organization, the International Center for Urban, uh, for Water Hazard and Risk Management, ICHAM. It was officially established as a UNESCO Category 2 Center and a part of the Public Works Research Institute in Japan in March 2000, uh, 2006. We are committed to three principal areas of activity. One is innovative research, which covers flood simulation, risk assessment, and spatial planning. We also aim to contribute to effective capacity building of engineering and practitioners in the world through educational program, including master and doctoral courses and short-term training courses. We also promote efficient information networking with relevant organizations in the world. In order to conduct risk-based land use and spatial planning, it is essential to assess and identify risks with science and technology. These results can support a transparent and rational process to identify target hazard risk and target hazard levels for designing land use and spatial planning. For successful implementation of the plan, it is essential to build social consensus on target hazard levels and to gain deeper understanding from different stakeholders. Land use and spatial planning is a powerful tool for future disaster risk reduction. However, the combination with other structural and non-structural measures can enhance the effectiveness of the planning. Today, I would like to introduce national and local approaches after the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake as uh, one typical example of risk-based planning. As a consequence of gigantic tsunami which hit the Pacific coast of Japan, 
More than 19,000 people died, and about 2,600 are still missing as of March 2017. It was a great tragedy. After this experience, the national government changed their attitude and decided to adapt two target levels of tsunami, level one tsunami, which frequently occur, and level two tsunami, which occur on large scale at intervals of several hundred years to several thousand years. Structural measures of improving levels are planned only for level one tsunami, as shown in this figure because structural investment against the level two tsunami exceed our national budget. Instead, for level two tsunami, we aim to protect human lives with integrated measures, combining structural and non-structural measures such as evacuation and land use planning. Here, I will introduce the effort for building back better of Ishinomaki city in Miyagi prefecture which is near Sendai City. This is a map of the main district in Ishinomaki City. Levy improvement have been conducted along the coastal line to protect the area only from level one tsunami. Then Ishinomaki City has identified the areas that are highly likely to be inundated by level two gigantic tsunamis and designated them as disaster risk areas encrossed by a red line in the map. Disaster risk area can be designated by a municipal ordinance under the National Building Standard Act. Disaster risk areas are used only for non-residential purposes, such as factories and fish markets or uh, memorial parks. Then the city government has promoted the relocation from inside to outside the disaster risk area. Inside the area, several tsunami evacuation towers, like this photo, have been constructed for people visiting or working in these areas in case of level two gigantic tsunami in order to achieve no casualties in future disasters. The combination of a land use plan with other countermeasures is very important. In addition, the elevated road networks are being constructed to stop tsunami waters spreading widely. Infrastructures should be assigned important roles in land use planning so that it, it provides multiple protection system against devastating hazards. The photo shows a part of Ishinomaki city that I visited last January. Can you see this empty area? As you can see, the disaster risk area here is under construction, as construction of elevated road networks takes a lot of effort and time. Now, more than six years have passed since the tsunami disaster. However, the reconstruction and relocation projects are still underway. In the affected areas, almost 90% of the land development for relocation have been done, and it is scheduled to be completed by March 2018. So we are really waiting for the next spring. So public consensus is essential to achieve such a long process of land use planning. So half a year after the tsunami disaster, a new act for tsunami resilient city was enacted in order to reduce tsunami disaster risk in coastal areas in Japan. Under this act, yellow, orange, and red zones are designated by prefecture governors based on tsunami simulation. In yellow zones, public awareness should be enhanced by tsunami hazard map and evacuation drills. Orange and red zones are subject to building regulations. In orange zone, for example, hospitals have to be so built that rooms are located higher than the depth of the target tsunami. In red zone, private houses are also regulated. As a contribution from private sectors, real estate agencies have a responsibility of explaining these risk zones when they sell or lend properties to potential residents. Next, I would also like to introduce the second example of local government. This is a practical approach against flood. 
Shiga Prefecture, located in Western Japan, adopted a very unique policy for integrated flood management considering flood inundation probability in pre-disaster land use planning. The prefecture government publishes precise flood inundation maps with a return period of 10, 100, and 200 years based on high-resolution inundation simulation coupled with laser-scanned precise elevation map. Then, Shiga Prefecture conducted land use planning using a risk matrix based on the flood inundation maps. Land use is determined according to the inundation probability and inundation levels of the target location. If an inundation of over 50 centimeters deep is expected to occur more than once in 10 years, the area will be taken off the list of the area for future urbanization. The condition is shown by green line in the risk matrix here. If uh, in inundation of over three meter deep is expected to occur more than once in 200 years, the area can be designated as a flood risk zone with uh, uh, residents agreement and construction of residents rooms below unexpected inundation level is prohibited for new construction and remodeling of houses. So this case is shown by yellow line in the matrix. This is one of the unique practices by local governments in Japan for disaster risk reduction using land use planning. In conclusion, uh, let me summarize the presentation starting with actions that should be taken at the national level. I pointed out the importance of legal framework and science technologies to identify and building so social consensus is crucial not only for successful pre-disaster land use planning, but also for realization of building back better. At the local government level, the effort should be focused on more risk-sensitive land use and spatial planning with several stages of zonings. For more effective disaster risk reduction, combination with other countermeasures such as evacuation, multiple use of infrastructure protection system, should be recommended. International cooperation is also very important. We at ICHAM aim to contribute to training of engineers and practitioners. Our educational programs provide opportunities to acquire the skill of risk-based land use planning and witness good practices through lectures and field trips. So if you have an interest in our activity, please visit our website here. Or um, today, I brought uh, many leaflets of my institution, I jam. So uh, please uh, visit me later if you want to get this. So thank you very much. Gracias. So one of the things that we see uh, regularly in the, in the communities of practice that you represent, that we represent, is the, the plea from local governments uh, to, to, uh, to find assistance, to find the means of creating the capacity to address uh, risk. And what we see here from, from, uh, from Miho's presentation, the very clear linkages between the role of the national government in creating a uh, policy that enables local government implementation of risk-informed uh, urban planning and controlling urban, ur urbanization processes in areas of risk. Um, in an example where a crisis, such as the, the tsunami of 2011, has generated massive transformation of the towns and cities in and around the Tohoku area in Japan from the perspective not only of uh, shifting urbanization and, and occupancy and use, uh, but also in cityscaping and in generating new topographies that are, that are uh, put in place to protect the assets and the people and the businesses and the communities in these areas of risk. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Miho. Okay, so moving along, 
Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Ebru Genser, who's the founding, director, founding executive director of the Center for Urban Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience, and is also a co-chair of UNISDR's Urban Planning Advisory Group, and a board member of the International Society of City and Regional Planners, uh, ISOPAR, uh, Center for Excellence in Planning. Ebru has a PhD in planning from Columbia University and has worked on the nexus of disaster risk reduction and urban development in southeastern Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean region, and I must say is a, an old colleague and friend, and I'm happy to welcome you here, Ebru. Yeah. As you wish. Apologies, just one moment, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, distinguished guests. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to speak here in front of you today. Uh, my presentation will be slightly different than uh, the colleagues uh, that presented before me. It will be a more theoretical discussion on how planning can be used to reduce disaster risk and what are some of the challenges and considerations in this process. And uh, this presentation is mostly based on our work as the Urban Planning Advisory Group to the UNISDR. And two outcomes of this work, uh, one of them is the Words into Action a Guide on Land Use Planning, uh, which my colleague Cassidy Johnson has led and the need and essentials for making cities resilient, uh, which I led on behalf of UPAC. Uh, before going into the findings of these projects, of these reports, I want to quickly stress some of the risk drivers in urban areas so that we can discuss what urban planning can do to remediate them. In very general terms, we can summarize uh, the risk drivers in four large umbrellas, taking into consideration that they are all complex and interlinked. First of these uh, risks are physical and spatial vulnerability, unplanned and rapid urban growth, substandard housing and infrastructure, type of terrain and geomorphology are the main drivers of risk in this category. Many times, urban settlements display physical vulnerabilities due to their location or construction practices, and they may be located on land not deemed appropriate for habitation because of its steep terrain or geof uh, geographical characteristics. Second set of uh, driver, risk, drivers of risks in urban areas are based on socioeconomic vulnerability, poverty and inequality, social exclusion, lack of empowerment are some of the risk drivers in this category. Differential access to land property rights, education, income, employment, infrastructure, housing and political power intensify vulnerability and risk of many urban residents, uh, particularly those in our informal settlements. Third set of uh, risk drivers in urban areas are based on institutional vulnerability, weak institutional arrangements, poor land management and governance, limited implementation and enforcement capacity. Obstacles such as political distrust, lack of communication and lack of coordination, inability to scale up successful programs and projects that may be dismissed due to government changes, inadequate means or ways to communicate risks and disasters to urban population, and corruption in the policy making and implementation process are some factors of institutional vulnerability in this category. And finally, the four sets are based on environmental and climatological factors. Environmental degradation and, ri and rising impacts of climate change. Urbanization is not only related to increased levels of emissions, but also it exerts pressure on ecosystems surrounding cities. Among others, for instance, changes in land use may cause changes in land surface physical characteristics 
that may have implications for water-related hazards. In particular, I want to quickly mention, uh, signify the importance of rapid urbanization as a risk driver that cuts across all vulnerabilities. Rapid urbanization not met with appropriate planning, institutions, and services lead to the increase of the urban poor, their exclusion from formal housing sectors result in growing informal settlements that create immense challenges in urban and risk management. Here in the example of Central America and Caribbean, one of the highly urbanized regions in the world, if we look in the example of Haiti and its urbanization rate in the last 50 years that rose rapidly from 7 to 17 to 52 percent, we can foresee the 70 percent of urban slum population and its deadly impacts in the ensuing earthquake of 2010. So what can planning do to remediate these mentioned risk drivers? First of all, it can reduce existing risks by various planning land use tools such as redevelopment or relocation and prevent future risks by informed, risk informed planning and zoning. For instance, for existing risk-prone urban settlements, planning can propose redevelopment and or the exclusion of safe land for transfer of such development to safer sites and the acquisition of development rights for future risk-sensitive urban growth. Planning can also facilitate mitigation, climate mitigation and adaptation, as well as the protection of ecosystems. Risk-informed planning can make use of innovative planning and urban design strategies to reduce disaster risks. Some strategies are environmental planning methods, blue-green infrastructure, public spaces, or transport-oriented development. Planning can also help reduce socioeconomic vulnerability and increase empowerment by increasing legal, adequate, and resilient housing stock for the most vulnerable through a participatory process. It can enable the provision of safe land and secure tenure for the urban poor, granting incre incremental legal status to informal settlements, and enhance the various inclusion of various stakeholders that will also ensure the effective implementation of plans. Planning can help good governance by developing linkages between different scales of responsibility, financing and institutional arrangements across sub-municipal, municipal, citywide, and regional levels, as well as create linkages with community initiatives. Improve and enhance planning systems, use existing resources, and create new opportunities for learning and improvement through monitoring and evaluation. Uh, what are then some of the challenges and prerequisites for undertaking uh, planning, for risk-informed planning, and then its implementation? First of all, we have to understand that planning does not occur in a vacuum. Uh, urban planning and development occurs in a complex web of laws, regulations, and instruments such as codes and standards, which should all be risk-informed, and this mostly requires a perspective shift in many of the nations uh, to include risk-informed laws and regulations. Here you can see a graph from the Words into Action Guide on land use planning uh, and the complex web of legislations surrounding land use planning and uh, risk-informed planning. A second prerequisite for undertaking plans is the availability of local urban and risk data. Planning and risk-informed planning requires availability of local urban data and micronized risk data. However, as many of you know, and it, as it has been like said many times in these sessions, uh, such data is limited. Creating and updating databases with evidence is key to planning decisions. Planning instruments, processes, and decisions are informed by evidence collected through rigorous methods, which should then be also analyzed uh, to ensure it is uh, feasibility. Such data sets cover demographic, socioeconomic, and physical areas that are influential to the city's development.
A third challenge in planning is the it's, it's multi-stakeholder and interdisciplinary nature. Planning is usually undertaken by uh, local city offices or sometimes by private companies. However, uh, there is a complex web of actors that are involved around planning and par uh, risk informed planning. And uh, the necessity of participatory planning approach is, uh, should be understood that to, inf uh, to ensure the uh, effective implementation. Here you can see that we recently did a stakeholder mapping for a city in El Salvador. And it's a small city with 200,000 population. You can see the complex web of actors that are involved in the planning decisions. And thinking in mind that this is a small city, when it goes into a metropolitan uh, city level, this web of actors uh, multiplies. A fourth issue, of course, and a very important issue that we all struggle with is the financing for implementation. It's very hard for local governments that are already financially constrained to undertake all planning projects and programs. Incorporating disaster risk reduction measures early on the project, planning and identification can reduce extra costs for implementing DRR measures. Some of the locally based approaches to financing include personal and corporate tax deductions for infrastructure built in low risk zones to particular res disaster resilience standards, subsidies for commerce, manufacturing and industrial enterprises, easements on high restrictions, risk based insurance and so on. And I want to conclude very quickly. And the fifth and last important piece of planning uh, prerequisite for planning is the capacity. Many of us uh, planners know that uh, traditional planning education did not include risk information, which started to be included in some of the planning schools only within the last 10 years. This requires a shift in planning education <coughs> for, excuse me, for future planners. Uh, here is an example of a, I'm sorry. <laughs> Here is an example of a, a planning exercise that are done by students at Columbia University, incorporating both seismology, engineering, and planning in a planning studio setting. Uh, such programs need to be uh, extended uh, to all the nations and cities for future planners. In addition, for existing planners who had not previously taken such risk-informed uh, uh, educations, uh, we, we suggest that uh, planning associations such as chamber or association of planners who give uh, certificates, who bestow as a, uh, professional licensing can develop uh, certificate programs or where they are not available, maybe international planning programs such as ISOCARP uh, can ensure certificate training for existing urban planners. And to conclude, uh, here are some of the further considerations in this arena. We have to remember that not every kind of planning builds resilience. All efforts must be made to ensure that planning visions have resilience and disaster risk reduction at their core so that they can be, become central to the purpose of planning. Secondly, a back to basics approach is central to resilience building. It implies keeping in mind that one of planning's purpose is to promote social and spatial equity and justice. Taking a strategic approach, this means ensuring access to well-located land, flexibility in standards and regulations, maintaining and developing infrastructure, public service delivery and financing. A third issue is DRR efforts must be mainstreamed through, throughout formal and informal planning processes and the entire planning cycle. Uh, including legal and regulatory frameworks, as well as financing arrangements. And finally, planning is a multi-actor process that involves governmental as well as non-governmental actors. Not all planning, uh, in fact, not much of the planning in, in the developing world is done by planners. The role of communities, the large, medium, small scale, private sector, and professionals must be acknowledged and supported. And policymakers must look for context-specific models and good practices and explore how they can be scaled up instead of applying one-fifth size solutions.
for further information into words into action guide on land use planning and for 10 essentials for making cities resilient, uh, here are the formations. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Ebru. Well, um, a very interesting conversation to and with planners about, uh, about risk-informed urban planning uh, that addresses the physical, spatial, socioeconomic, institutional, and environmental vulnerability, vul vulnerabilities of cities around the world. And some interesting concepts related to transformative techniques that rely on regulation, uh, again, the issue of regulation enabling um, uh, risk-informed planning, uh, access to data, certainly the, the finance and the capacity of uh, professionals that are um, driving the planning processes in cities around the world. But a very, very important comment as well about stakeholders and understanding where decisions are taken. They're not always taken by local government and they're not always taken by uh, national governments. In fact, they're not always taken by government, period. And understanding that the role of, of the multiple array of stakeholders that, are, that have a stake in uh, uh, a risk-informed urban plan and development process is a critical takeaway, I think, from that. Thank you very much, Ebru. Okay, so we're going to move on now to a man who has already been introduced to you. Uh, Roland Ocampo is the Vice President of the Mex Mexican National Institute for Statistics and Geography. He's the co-chair of the UN Committee of Experts on Global Geospatial Information Management and a focal point for GEO, the Group on Earth Observations. Um, Roland will talk to you more about uh, the development and uh, custodianship of, of data and access to data for making informed land and spatial planning for disaster risk reduction. Rolando. Muchas gracias. Eh, buenos, buenas tardes a todos ustedes. El, voy a hablar eh, más que en, en mis actividades dentro del el INEGI, del Instituto Nacional de Estadística y Geografía. Voy a hablar en mi carácter de presidente de la iniciativa eh, global de expertos en información geoespacial, UNGGIM, eh, que que estoy copresidiendo con Estados Unidos y con China eh, y voy a también en mi calidad de eh, representante de mi país en la iniciativa de, de GEOS. Eh, y lo que, que, lo que quisiera eh, hablar y comentar es le, platicarles sobre estas dos, de, de estos dos organismos que están trabajando sobre temas de información geoespacial y sobre el manejo de eh, la administración de la tierra. Déjenme nomás eh, hablar y hacer algunos eh, comentarios sobre los retos que tenemos en temas de, eh, de la administración de la tierra. Comentar que hay una muy limitado eh, eh, en el mundo el, el, el manejo de la tierra y la, la tenencia de la tierra a nivel global es, es limitado, solamente puede Cubrir, eh, cubre el 30% a nivel global de, de población que tiene control sobre la tenencia de la tierra y en algunos países esto llega a ser al nivel del 3%. Eh, también hay una gran complejidad en el manejo de estos eh, registros en los países y eh, eh, podríamos eh, decir, según UN Habitat, eh, que entre el 70 y el 75% de eh, la población total eh, no tiene una documentación sobre la tenencia de, eh, de la tierra, de la habitación donde, donde ellos habitan. En ese sentido, eh, y con la información que, que tenemos y el, el, el trabajo que se ha, se ha visto, se ha, se ha identificado que cada vez más la información geoespacial, la información que proviene de los institutos eh, geográficos y de, la, de las observaciones de la tierra, cada vez están participando más y tienen más eh, 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 forma para poder incorporarse a la medición de muchos trabajos. No solamente comentar eh, sobre eh, el qué en los Objetivos de Desarrollo Sostenible, quiénes, cómo lo tienen que hacer, 
eh, sobre, para la medición de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, sino en dónde, dónde podemos ubicar todos esos trabajos. Creo recordar que todo pasa en algún lugar y todo puede ser, es digno de georreferenciarse. En ese sentido, eh, comentar sobre esta iniciativa que nace en el 2011 ante, lo, eh, ante la preocupación de los países sobre el manejo de la información geoespacial. Había una eh, preocupación razonada sobre el, al interior de cada uno de los países de cómo se estaba manejando esta información de las imágenes satelitales y la información eh, geoespacial y que eh, eh, esto estaba siendo cada vez más eh, controlado por la iniciativa privada, pero en realidad el mandato de los países es donde reside el manejo de esta información geoespacial. Es responsabilidad de los países el cómo usar esa información geoespacial. En ese sentido, se creó esta iniciativa que el año pasado tuvo un fortalecimiento en el seno de ECOSOC, para eh, el, el cual eh, le da mucha fuerza también a esta iniciativa y le pide a los países que participen de manera más activa, reforzando todos los lineamientos. Tenemos una agenda global, en la parte se han creado diferentes grupos de trabajo, uno que tiene que ver con las partes fundamentales de la geografía y la información, que tiene que ver con el marco de referencia global, todo lo que tiene que ver con la geodesia, otro que tiene que ver con el manejo de la información estadística y geográfica, cómo incorporar la parte estadística a, la, a los mapas, a la parte geográfica, otro eh, que son los que nos eh, tienen que ver con, estos, el, con, con este evento, uno que tiene que ver con, la, con el, la administración de la tierra y uno más que tiene que ver sobre eh, la información para desastres eh, provocados, eh, desastres, eh, provocados por fenómenos naturales. El, el, eh, en esta iniciativa de Naciones Unidas de el, hay un grupo, eh, este grupo de trabajo tiene los grandes objetivos, pues provocar que los países eh, puedan tener y se, y se genere todo un liderazgo en las políticas para el manejo de las administraciones eh, de la tierra, cómo incorporar la información geoespacial en este, en este, en este propósito y el, el, la función que tiene el grupo de trabajo de, de, de esta iniciativa es como tener un foro de, de, de consultas y un foro de información y cómo generar las normas técnicas que puedan ser útiles para eh, utilizar esta información a nivel nacional, a nivel eh, global y a nivel eh, regional. Por supuesto, todo lo que tiene que ver en eh, cómo incorporar la información geoespacial en, la, en, en términos de la administración de la tierra, en los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, que es una de las iniciativas que, en las que estamos eh, participando. Eh, estamos ya, eh, solamente por mencionar, dentro de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible, tiene que ver con el tema de administración de la tierra, pues en al menos y, y en, en 11 de los objetivos eh, de desarrollo sostenible. Uno de ellos, por ejemplo, el, 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 el objetivo número uno, que tiene que ver el indicador 1.4.2, que tiene que ver con la proporción de adultos que tienen derechos y que tienen con la tenencia de la tierra. Toda esta información, que si bien es cierto, se puede tener con tabulados eh, para poder identificar por, por eh, de esta información, también se puede georreferenciar y la información geoespacial puede tener una participación muy activa, coadyuvando en la identificación de estos, de estos objetivos. Otro de ellos es el, el, el objetivo 5, que tiene que ver con temas de género, pues identificar cómo son los propiedad, la, la, la propiedad de la tierra dependiendo por género y pues en esto también creo con la información que se tiene, por un lado de, eh, el, que podemos georreferenciar con la información de los censos de población que estamos trabajando también para participar en cómo georreferenciar toda la información que provenga de la próxima ronda censal 2020, pues eso nos va a poder permitir incorporar 
esta, en, este, en este indicador, cómo participar activamente y poder hacer una diferenciación en estos términos. Eh, hablando de, 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 de asociaciones, pues eh, lo que estamos buscando dentro de esta iniciativa global es cómo tener asociaciones con otras iniciativas, en particular la que, la que, de la que voy a presentar en adelante, que es con GEO, pero también con OGC, que es este organismo que se dedica a generar y a producir normas eh, técnicas, estándares que tienen que ver con la información geoespacial, todo esto en un ámbito de código abierto para poder participar. Por, también con, los con el Banco Mundial estamos trabajando en particular sobre este tema y con la eh, eh, Oficina Internacional de Topógrafos. Pero no solamente a nivel de estas organizaciones, pero también el, con la iniciativa privada. Buena parte de los, de, los, de los recursos que utilizamos los países y los especialistas en información geoespacial, pues proviene de la, de la adquisición de imágenes satelitales, de tecnología, de desarrollos de plataformas y entonces pues necesitamos esta asociación con ellos para poder trabajar en conjunto y utilizar esta información en, en términos y que nos apoyen a los países en cómo construir todas estas herramientas para el seguimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Perdón, el, eh, la siguiente que quisiera eh, presentar es otra, o, o, otra iniciativa eh, eh, mundial, que es eh, el Grupo de Observadores de la Tierra, que es un organismo eh, intergubernamental, voluntario, que no tiene fines de lucro, en la cual estamos agregados los países que queremos participar y también otras organizaciones académicas e instituciones. Tenemos la participación de 105 países que están participando y eh, 109 organizaciones que están apoyando eh, académicas, organismos, universidades, de todo tipo que están apoyando para, uh, para uh, esta iniciativa. Los objetivos de GEO, pues lo que pretenden es generar la, eh, información tanto de, de la observación de la Tierra, tanto en la parte marina, en la parte terrestre. Y me voy a enfocar en esta parte ahora, en la parte de la, de la cobertura eh, de la Tierra y cómo evaluar el progreso de esta información en, y con la participación de la, de, la, de la academia para poder dar seguimiento a muchas otras actividades, en particular lo que tiene que ver con los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Eh, déjeme darles algunos ejemplos, el tema de, eh, perdón, de, de, de urbanización, eh, en donde esta, esta iniciativa puede participar, en, par en, en particular pues en, en el indicador 11.3, que es el, ratio, el, el radio que tiene la proporción de población con el, con el consumo de, de tierra, ahí se ven las tres imágenes, cómo va variando y cómo va, se va comiendo la mancha urbana a la parte territorial. El segundo, que tiene que ver con la degradación de la tierra, también eh, en otro de los objetivos, el, en, el, en el objetivo número 15. Eh, comentar el, el, las asociaciones que también estamos teniendo, particular para poder proporcionar esta información en la parte geoespacial, un foro que acabamos de tener con la participación de más de 30 países eh, sobre eh, ciudades inteligentes y la resiliencia dentro del marco de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible. Finalmente, quisiera concluir diciendo que estas eh, asociaciones y en la integración de los datos, incluida la, la información geoespacial y la observación de la Tierra, pueden apoyar de manera significativa en el seguimiento de los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible y, por supuesto, como en las presentaciones, eh, las dos presentaciones que tuvimos, tanto de Chile como de Japón, pues en el seguimiento de los eventos catastróficos para el monitoreo de desastres. Mejor información resulta en una mejor toma de decisiones. En la medida en la que estemos coordinados en ese sentido, vamos a poder tener mejor información para el desarrollo económico y el desarrollo total. Eh, la contribución y la, la, el, entre el buen, el buen gobierno, la tenencia de la tierra y eh, lo que nos rige, pues bueno, es fundamental para esto. Y finalmente decir que las asociaciones son un elemento fundamental y es, eh, la cooperación es necesaria para poder lograr estos objetivos y la coordinación entre todos nosotros. 
Muchas gracias eh, eh, por su tiempo. Rolando, thank you very much for that. Um, again, uh, stressing the importance of forging new, new partnerships and collaborations uh, on the generation, uh, acquisition, and access to data to better inform decision making, to help in planning for planning out risk, let's say, and building in resilience, for tracking and measuring the implementation of the sustainable development agenda. And I think one very critical point from, the, from the, be the beginning of Rolando's presentation on the importance of access to geospatial data as a means of securing the rights to land and property for that 70% of the population uh, of, the, of the planet that currently do not have uh, recognized, documented, and formal rights of use and occupancy. I mean, this is, I think, a very critical point. Okay, so that concludes the, the, the panel presentations. Um, I'm going to call on one of the uh, discussants that's, uh, that's to per perhaps going to give us a different view. Um, Khaled Abouache is the Director of Physical Planning and Architecture, the head of the Disaster Risk Redu Reduction Unit, Aqaba Special Economic Zone Authority in Jordan. And this perspective is a perspective that that comes from, let's say, the user side, the implementing side, uh, and representing government, local government uh, in this particular field. Um, Khaled, please, what are your views on, the, on the, uh, the key points of the panel? <coughs> Is there a working microphone? Thank you, Sherman, for uh, giving me the chance to shed the light on my experience in land use planning. I will speak from a practitioner point of perspective uh, as a local government. Uh, uh, I come from the city of Aqaba uh, in Jordan. Aqaba is a role model city in localizing disaster risk reduction and a member of the My City is Getting uh, Ready campaign. Uh, our risk drivers are the narrow, limited geographical strip, uh, which is Aqaba, is located in the, northern, in the northern tip of the Gulf Aqaba. Also, the high demand of land due to the transformation of the city into a special economic zone. So you can understand the pressure that we are facing as a practitioners from the private sector on the land while we have a very limited land suitable for the development. In addition to that, we are facing the hazards of uh, flash flood and earthquake. So in 2001, when the city was transferred to a special economic zone, we have uh, adopted a master plan. The master plan was uh, uh, to give uh, the horizon and projection for the year 2030. And this master plan was market-driven. It was supposed to guide development and investment in the zone. Again, with the pressure that we have in hand from the private sector on, on, on the demand in the land, there was a, wild, a, a wise decision, if I should say, by the local authority, the Aqaba Special Economic Zone, to uh, start implementing and mainstreaming disaster risk reduction as a way to uh, to reduce vulnerability. So in 2009, we embarked in a project which was funded by UNDV, and we went through our master plan. We start revising this master plan, and we utilize all the risk information that we already had in our risk assessment profile, and we start producing risk maps uh, for the city of Aqaba. This is, was a very, uh, uh, very good process, and an eye-opener for decision-makers at that time because we, we were able to define and map out the risk area utilizing <coughs> microzonation maps and the flood-prone area. <coughs> However, we still are uh, facing many challenges. Among them is the political pressure that we are in. As all of us know that land use planning is not only a technical process, it's a political pressure. And when you have a political pressure, 
on you. Sometimes you cannot really uh, implement all the, the ideas that you feel that will lead to sustainability. Uh, despite that fact that uh, right now uh, we have succeeded in, in, in mainstreaming disaster risk, disaster risk reduction in our land use planning, I can say that our land use plan at the moment is almost risk informed. We managed to revise our urban policies to make it risk informed. Uh, we have collaborated and made a lot of partnership with ISRI utilizing GIS systems. At the moment, we are going to utilize uh, city engine and city labs and city works uh, applications to better manage the, the, the city of, of Aqaba. Uh, the land use planning process, uh, it's still uh, not well established in, at the national level in Jordan. Uh, and also in, in the regional part. But in Aqaba, there is, there is a success story, and, and right now we are in underway. We are trying to replicate this, this model uh, within the country of Jordan, where we, we will engage in a dialogue among uh, the municipalities and then review the master plan to make it risk-informed. Uh, and I can recall, for example, Petra, because they are facing the same hazards. They have uh, heritage sites, and right now we are working uh, closely with them to revise their master plan in order to make it risk uh, informed to protect some of the heritage sites. I will leave my uh, speak in a very important note, which is the traditional knowledge. What really amazed me when we start doing land use planning in Aqaba is that we have the old town. And the very interesting thing about the old town is that it was well planned when the time there was no plans, but it was well planned and the, you can see that it was in mainstreaming with the flash floods and, and the way that water comes. And this is very important for me. Traditional knowledge is very important in land use planning, even though with all the technologies, with all the techniques that we are talking, but sometimes we try to overlook that as a practitioners. But in my case, traditional knowledge was very important and I really think that if we're going to start at the local level, traditional knowledge is very important, not only from the technical part of it, but it's very important to listen to the people and to understand their question, because after all, they will be part of the solution and they will buy your product. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Khaled. Um, Okay, I, I'd uh, also like then to take this moment to call on uh, Dr. Richard Slusas from the University of Trent uh, to perhaps provide us with his reflections on the content of the panel and what is happening uh, in your world. Okay, thanks very much, Dan, uh, for this un a little bit unexpected invitation, but anyway. Um, I enjoyed the discussion very much. Uh, I, I think it's uh, it's a very challenging area, and it's an area which I have enjoyed a number of presentations uh, in the course of this meeting. I think one which struck me particularly uh, was a, an input from um, Kathy Oldham yesterday from Manchester, who really pointed out, I think, in a number of ways how you can use uh, and, and incorporate disaster risk reduction measures inside regular planning procedures, um, com but it needs to be combined with all the other issues. It's not the only thing that planners have to contend with. And I think this was also made clear by many of the presentations today and especially the, also the last uh, intervention that we just had from Jordan. Um, but these, there are sort of moments in planning processes where risk reduction, risk sensitivity can be, I think, enhanced. And it's a matter of making use of those opportunities. Many planners maybe haven't really been brought up to understand risk, and this is a major problem. Um, as I'm a member of UPAC together with, with Ebru, and last year we initiated a, a, a survey amongst planning schools to see how much attention is being given to risk issues and resilience issues in the planning courses. And of course it's increasing, but if you look around the responses that we got, many of the schools are not giving very much attention and some none at all. 
And that's, of course, a major bottleneck um, because this is the next generation. And so we've got, I think, to take some pretty immediate action if we really want a series about this to, to deal with it, uh, to pr start producing planners who are themselves much more aware of the risk situation, but also aware of what their role is in both aggravating risk if they are by making perhaps uh, insufficiently informed decisions but also their role, a, a very strong role that they could play in actually reducing risk. Um, and prevention, I think, is, is one of the key issues in many parts of the world, especially those parts which are still in early stages of urbanisation but are changing very fast. If I'm thinking of cities in sub-Saharan Africa and also in Asia with, where growth rates may be 5 6% per annum, there are major concerns, I think, and there's a really strong need for, for immediate... Um, action to really make the planning system um, much more risk sensitive. One of the, and I'll just make one more point, and that's coming from the survey where when we, one of the questions we asked was which issues, which methods and tools did the people from the planning schools think were most important. Um, there were sort of four issues unsurprisingly I would say legislation and regulation were the top two, both on the planning regulations as well as on building codes and regulations. But that has to do, I think, with much of planning work is very, a little bit bureaucratic, say, the administrative size, side of planning. But there's also a, a great concern. Uh, the other two things were more on the plan making side, being able to better make multi criteria evaluations of situations to, so to bring the risk into the other issues and look at it in a more integrated way, and to have effective risk uh, mapping, risk, risk zoning uh, tools available. Saying that though, it's, it's also important that planners, planners understand that risk is also very dynamic, that hazards are dynamic um, and also the vulnerabilities and the exposure levels are extremely dynamic and so it's not a one-off exercise. It needs to be repeated, it needs to be looked at critically time and time again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Okay, um, I'd like to now open up the, uh, the floor for comments or for particularly for questions to the panelists. Um, starting with the gentleman on the, on the back there with his bike. Please introduce yourself and, uh, and pose your question. Uh, my name is Peter Lowy. I am liaison for architecture and planning for the United Nations Major Group for Children and Youth. Um, I'd like to ask a question to Professors Morris and Genser. Um, as educators, um, I was once told that I was not allowed to teach architecture students about planning and sustainable development because it wouldn't help them pass their licensing exam. And I've heard similar things from planning students in planning departments said. Um, simply, how can we change the planning paradigm to better reflect the innovation that comes out of our students' work? Thank you. Thank you very much for your question. <clears throat> and my apologies, I've lost my voice, so. <clears throat> Maybe we. Maybe if we. <laughs> Maybe if we hear three questions <coughs> and then we can go on. Do you, who has another? Yes? My name is Milin Pimplikar. I'm chairman of the Canis uh, Network. We're working on micro nano satellites based solutions for uh, geospatial applications, DRR, urban planning, and so on. Uh, I'd like to congratulate the group that was uh, mentioned uh, by Mr. Uh, Rolando Campio on this. Uh, under the United Nations Committee includes the GOs, CEOs, and so on. There are three points I was kind of uh, would like to bring. One is the, you mentioned there is some mechanism for coordination of this space, geospatial data. But the big challenge uh, that what we found, we organized a workshop at Sendai in 2015 with UNOSA, the World Bank, and the big 
uh, outcome challenge that we found was how do we get this data in the hands of the planners in the timely manner, and that you mentioned there is a group uh, which is basically on integrated and timely data. But that's one of the biggest challenge that we've observed that which still hasn't been uh, addressed, you know? And number two, you mentioned about the sharing uh, guiding principles. This is another big challenge that we observe that there is a big challenge of how do you share the data, uh, especially for the planners when they need uh, you know, when uh, there, is a, uh, there is a lack of uh, coordination and so on. And my last question is especially to uh, our colleague from Japan. Uh, when you had this uh, uh, planning process for the risk aversion, when you are looking at 10 years, 100 years, and 200 years, and so on, how do you uh, develop the process methodology, especially using the tools and technique for this uh, that we have in place and uh, how you plan those emerging uh, tools, techniques for, uh, thank you. Thank you, another one, the third one, just in the front. Thank you very much for your very insightful presentations. My name is Yolanda Alberto. I am an assistant professor at the University of Tokyo. And my question is, what are the current measures or the measures that can be taken to get the private and insurance sectors involved with land use planning? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I think, uh, who wants to answer the first question? Yeah, the first question. Uh, thank you very much um, for the gentleman from the youth group who asked for the question about uh, integration of planning uh, risk information into planning education. Okay. Uh, I think the best way going forward would be the support of the planning uh, associations uh, in this regard. Uh, uh, planning associations and schools of planning, chambers of schools of planning, uh, such as the European Schools of Planning Program, ASOP, or uh, in the US, the ACSP, and in Australia, uh, the planning schools organizations need to uh, need to develop this agenda and uh, expand it to the planning schools in yeah. their regions. And uh, what my friend Richard was like mentioning about, he did uh, uh, an intensive survey, extensive survey with ASO and uh, I think ACSP too, no, Richard, uh, to uh, to discuss what what are the current issues of integrating uh, risk, or like what are the needs of these planning schools to integrate risk education. So I think uh, going, uh, I think Richard will follow on that uh, with the association of planning schools, and that may be the best way to approach. Thank you. Um, I'm going to give the voice for the second questions first for my, my colleague from Japan. So I understand you asked how the government decides the return period level of 10 and 100 and 200 years. So in Shiga prefectures, a river facility is designed with, the 10, with the assuming the flat with 100 year return period. So it means 200 year return period is a level of exceeding the structural design level of current structures. So it is a kind of a level two flat. So in the 10 year flat means a very frequently one. So today I talked the tsunami and introduced the two level of uh, target, but in Shiga prefecture, they are assuming three levels and the 200 year return period is the maximum one. Thank you. So, but uh, and it depends on the area. So it is a case of a Shiga prefecture. Uh, para responder las otras dos, dos preguntas sobre la iniciativa global, eh, efectivamente hay re grandes retos para la coordinación entre las diferentes eh, áreas. Este, el, el grupo de trabajo 
de eh, desastres de la iniciativa global, incorpora también a varios actores que tienen que ver con el manejo de desastres, no solamente en la parte de la información geoespacial. Y lo que se pretende es cómo fijar normas, lineamientos, para que los países puedan aplicar y en su momento incorporar la información geoespacial en los, la toma de decisiones, cómo proveer de manera adecuada e inmediata toda esa información que proviene de los, los mapas, pero también la, la, la mezcla de la información estadística y geográfica para aplicarlo en, en un evento eh, catastrófico. ¿no? Eh, la tercera pregunta se la voy a dejar a mi compañero eh, de Chile. ¿Aló? Sí. Eh, so, brevemente, respecto a la primera pregunta, eh, el, el, respecto a la educación, en Chile la, la, la planificación urbana ha estado esencialmente relacionada a las escuelas de arquitectura y cada vez que viene un evento hay una participación puntual después del evento, pero eso se olvida y no, hay, no se ha integrado en los programas. Sin embargo, experiencias como esta están permitiendo periodos de mayor eh, estadía y estamos teniendo una gran cantidad de estudiantes de pregrado y posgrado participando ya que la universidad se, se instala como un actor local. Y lo, lo segundo respecto a la pregunta del rol del, del, del sector privado, en, en, en el caso de Chile, gran parte de la infraestructura de servicio está privatizada, pero sobre modelos eh, bastante antiguos, donde eh, no se consideran los costos indirectos, sino que más bien los costos directos. Y, y, y todo la, el, el aporte después de un evento está puesto en la reposición. Y la, la mirada más estructural, que es la que se necesita tener hoy día, es cuáles son los costos reales, tanto los indirectos como los, los directos, y la, eh, lo que es tangible e intangible. Y, y por lo tanto se debiera revisar estos tipos de, de contrato. Abrimos para otra ronda de, de preguntas. Aquí hay, hay una de la, de la colega, ahí hay la segunda y aquí está la tercera y una cuarta y para ahí. Para mí. ¿Sí? Eh, hola, mi nombre es Claudia González, eh, yo soy eh, planificadora, eh, trabajo en consultoría y en planificación territorial en Chile. Eh, la pregunta es en relación a cuáles debieran ser las prioridades en la planificación eh, informada respecto de los riesgos en relación a las ciudades que hoy día existen. En los casos en que, que mostró tanto Roberto como Mijo, eh, se mostró casos en que son ciudades que han sido devastadas o bastante afectadas por algún tipo de desastre, pero eh, en el caso que mencionó Ebru, eh, se refirió a los drivers, eh, a, lo, a los factores subyacentes del riesgo y en el fondo la pregunta tiene que ver con cómo abordar esos factores en las ciudades que hoy día tenemos con una planificación que en el fondo debiera hacerse cargo de una ciudad existente. Gracias. La siguiente eh, pregunta, estaba por allá el colega, por, a, al fondo, al fondo. El, que, el señor que está levantando la mano. No, no, no. Es, eh. Thank you very much. My name is Brigadier General Msuya from Tanzania. I am the Director of Disaster Management at the Prime Minister Office. I thank you very much for the good presentation that has been done by the presenters from different angles. Uh, they have been talking about um, different uh, risk zones, including the um, flood, earthquake, and many other. And then we have been furthermore informed that there are factors that are affecting the good work that uh, the, our planners are doing. Uh, such as uh, unplanned and rapid urban uh, growth is affecting the, 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 the plan that we have already. And the weak institution and the arrangement, uh, climate change that I can see is uh, wide. And the decision makers sometimes, the plan are saying we, do, we have to do this and then the, the, the decision maker comes with the uh, own the decision. And my, my, my question is really going 
further on land management, uh, I ask the panelists, how can we apply risk transfer as a modality of mitigation measures in the issues that we are discussing on land management? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Kees van der Vruchten from the Netherlands, uh, representing the uh, government of the Netherlands and working with an institute which develops data and models, which is Deltares. I listened to a number of interesting presentations, and there are a number of good initiatives mentioned to disclose and enhance the, uh, and, and um, uh, fulfill the wish for access to more data and better data. And I would underline that very much. Of course, there's a plea as well for not only data, but also for good information and sharing it with a number of stakeholders. Um, there are many different stakeholders, and I would have the idea and would have the reflection of the panel that we could do better in not only providing data, also good information, but including translating it to different target groups. These are users for their own analysis, like governments and investors, but also to vulnerable groups. A very good example is present here where we have an interpreter for a vulnerable group among the audience. And one of the groups that needs specific information are the investors, the investors to follow up to the planning which has been uh, developed. And my additional question would be, would you see, um, do you see a gap or maybe not? whether or not there's enough information and good information for investors to follow up on the planning developed. And in addition to that, do we have information to evaluate such investment as to refer to the intentions of the standard framework, to invest in preventive measures and to evaluate it in a sense like um, how much investments have been made in risk-informed interventions and as an example from the Netherlands, for example, we invest some 0.2% of our national across the domestic product in preventive measures to protect against flooding. And the result is that we have avoided losses if incidents would occur as we may expect from projected uh, climate change impacts. Avoided losses are up to 2% of um, our gross domestic product. Prevention pays back. That's the message from that type of data and information. Could I have your reflections, please, on that one? Okay. Um, if you want the first uh, questions for uh, Ever, yes. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, I think you made a very good point, which I uh, also mentioned briefly in the presentation, that um, it really requires a perspective shift in both national and local governments to, in, uh, to input disaster risk reduction into the planning process. And uh, this usually comes, as you said, uh, well through in like Chile, we saw this, in Japan we saw this, we saw this in the example of Istanbul, that it usually takes a disaster to make this uh, impact on the government to start planning for the next disaster. Uh, but I think we also have to take into consideration that uh, many of these risks that I mentioned about the, the risk drivers are everyday risks that uh, people face every day in informal settlements, uh, everyday floods. So sometimes it doesn't really need like big disasters to occur. And uh, many of the cities, or in like some nations, there is not really always a master planning process. Uh, it's possible to do this in an incremental approach through small projects uh, to tackle uh, these, uh, what we call extensive, uh, not intensive, but extensive risks of everyday risks. Hello. Eh, bueno, respecto a la primera pregunta sobre la, las prioridades, como decía, 
Chile, con este modelo de, de crecimiento económico y disminución de la pobreza, ha, ha generado una sociedad extremadamente inequitativa y eso, a pesar de tener conciencia de eso, no, no se ha logrado avances relevantes para cambiar ese modelo. Sin embargo, eh, esta alta recurrencia de eventos catastróficos está presionando el sistema y es, podría llegar a ser que efectivamente esta mayor conciencia de riesgo sí permita abordar estos problemas estructurales. Así es que yo percibo que la, la prioridad en las ciudades que ya han sido productos de este modelo y que tienen altos niveles de, de, de vulnerabilidad es que se, 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 se atacara precisamente a los grupos eh, más vulnerables, que son los que están localizados en las zonas de riesgo, que también terminan siendo los más pobres y que por lo tanto algunos de ellos o requiera relocalización o obras de, de mitigación. So, about the prioritization, I'd like to add some more things. So, for the transparent process of land use and spatial planning, it is very essential to provide the risk information with science and technologies, so those information can support the decision making and the uh, proper uh, procedures for prioritize uh, uh, proper land use planning. Gracias. Para la segunda y la tercera eh, preguntas, yo eh, lo que me quisiera eh, referir es precisamente a, a la información eh, geoespacial. El, el, tanto para la parte de para poder eh, aplicar lo, las, las transferencias de recursos y para la aplicación de la, eh, las inversiones para tomar de una mejor manera, yo considero y creo que el, el hecho de poder alinear la información geoespacial en los diferentes ámbitos, por un lado, por lo que tiene que ver por el manejo de la tierra, por otro lado, la perfecta ubicación de, el, el, del, del territorio con el, un marco geodésico eh, universal que ya fue aprobado en Naciones Unidas en la, en, en la, por la Asamblea. Eh, por otro lado, la construcción de normas técnicas que puedan servir para homogeneizar toda una información que pueda ser utilizada por los países en términos geográficos, en términos geoespaciales, eh, cómo incorporar la vinculación estadística en la parte geoespacial. Eh, los trabajos, por ejemplo, en Holanda que, estamos, que, que están participando con nosotros, el catastro, el catastro de, de, de Holanda, pues han servido de mucho para poder arrancar y poder posicionar estos trabajos en el manejo, de la, en la administración de la tierra. Eh, Holanda preside este grupo de trabajo. Y en la parte de la vinculación para los países en vías de, 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 de desarrollo, pues cómo poder toda esta información, todas estas normas técnicas y con toda la información geoespacial que tenemos de diferentes actores a niveles con información que es eh, gratuita, como las imágenes Landsat, como las imágenes Copernicus, como las imágenes de algunos satélites eh, chinos, pues bueno, eso nos puede, puede traer grandes, grandes apoyos para poder aplicar esta información y redireccionar en la medida correcta para apoyar en los eventos eh, catastróficos. Mencionar, México tiene una plataforma de desastres construida desde el Instituto Nacional de Estadística y Geografía que aporta, al momento de una catástrofe, aporta toda esa base de datos y la pone en un buffer para que pueda ser utilizada por el Centro Nacional de Prevención de Desastres y por Protección Civil, que en su momento se activa y permanece activa durante todo el tiempo. La idea es cómo hacer esa vinculación a nivel, a nivel, eh, eh, a nivel global y cómo buscar los, 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 los acuerdos institucionales al interior de los países para que esto se pueda dar. Eh, yo con esto, eh, por, por tiempo, yo le pasaría la voz a mi otro eh, co-chair del grupo para que haga un summary de la, de la reunión y poder así eh, concluir. Well, thank you very much, Rolando, and thank all of you for, for those questions uh, and to our panelists as well. 
trying to summarize the meeting. <laughs> there is an incredible amount of content uh, that was provided both uh, through the panelists' presentations from the discussants and, and, from, and in their response to your queries. But let me just try to set out what we first started to do. The Sendai framework stresses the need to reduce exposure and vulnerability while preventing the creation of new disaster risks by focusing on tackling underlying disaster risk drivers, which includes unplanned and rapid urbanization as well as poor land management. Each one of the presenters addressed elements of this particular ob objective of this session in terms of the generation, storage, creation, and access uh, to large-scale data sets, um, the, which Rolando has been talking about and which many of you have talked about as well. We talked about the best practices, the, the, the fact that there are best practices out there in terms of uh, the acquisition, the sharing, and the dissemination of data for better improved decision making. And this is a, this is a critical element of addressing uh, the, the disposition and use of land, uh, particularly from a risk-informed point of view. We talked about the profession of planning, and we talked about the the transformation of, of, of the profession to one that uh, in a learning cycle begins to integrate the recognition of risk as a, as a driver for transforming the way cities are planned. We heard practical examples from, from Chile and from Japan where cities are, have been transformed Sadly, in both cases, as the, as the result of crisis uh, forcing a transformation, uh, but, and, and recognizing that quite often this is the driver for uh, change uh, in cities and for rapid transformation of cities. And we heard some practical, uh, some practical suggestions in terms of probabilistic risk modeling, uh, controlling the manner and, spati and the spatial distribution of, uh, of urbanization patterns. We, we saw real examples of the use of uh, and protection of public space uh, as a means of protecting cities, both in Japan and in Chile. We saw the importance of mobility and the access and egress elements uh, essential in cities that are in constant exposure to uh, risk, particularly in the case of Chile, from uh, from flooding and earthquakes, and of course in Japan from from earthquakes and uh, and uh, tsunamis. We also heard interesting projections around planning horizons, and more than once we heard comments uh, about the process of transforming cities, whether they're risk informed or whether they're resilience informed, is not one that happens overnight. Cities transform slowly in every instance, save those instances where crisis creates a motivation or a driver for transformation. Um, and so time is, is a big issue. From Aqaba, we heard that good ideas can sometimes carry risk with them. So the creation of a special economic zone in the city of Aqaba has created the potential risk of uh, that can be, can be associated with rapid urbanization. Uh, and this is, this is a phenomenon that we see in other parts of the world where the pace of, of urbanization is outpacing the capacity of local governments to actually react and keep up with uh, the, the expansion of, and delivery of services. Um, I think more than once we heard the the truth that risk-informed planning is not something you bolt on to a normal planning process. In fact, what we're talking about and what many people are talking about is the integration of risk or resilience measures in regular urban planning, in regular urban development, and in, in regular and normal urban governance processes. So it's not something you add on, it's something that you build in. Um, and we, we talked about a few, uh, a few of the challenges that 
that have emerged through the communities of practice related to the importance of engaging all stakeholders in, in risk-informed urban development. Um, I al already mentioned the int integration of knowledge into the learning processes for uh, professionals to ensure that there's capacity at local level for implementation. And Miho's last point, that, that it's critical that um, the scientific and technical community are a part of the process of, of the translation of data uh, into informed, risk-informed urban planning processes. I would like to close with one further reflection. And that is in, in throughout the presentations and the, and the conversations here, we've talked about and we've heard about the need for national governments to step up and ensure that the national policy and regulatory frameworks enable the development of risk-informed urban development. Um, we've, we, and and the, the, the role of policy in enabling this. We've, we've heard time and again the importance of design uh, in urban planning and understanding that uh, transforming, transforming existing urban systems requires new approaches to design that integrate risk, uh, risk-based planning to help us plan out risk and build in resilience. Again and again, we heard, costs, we heard conversations around financing, uh, around economies and protecting economies or nurturing economies or expanding economies. We, t we heard uh, also about legislation, rules, regulations that enable protocols to do everything from access uh, and dissemination and sharing of data to actually making decisions on urban development processes. And throughout the conversation, we talked about local implementation and the capacity of local governments to be able to implement. Five things. These are the five fundamental principles and pillars of the new urban agenda that was uh, passed in October at the, uh, in Quito last year. And the, the resonance of the new urban agenda with the Sendai framework and the principles that we've discussed here today in this panel, I think are in a, one essential takeaway that uh, it's, it's our view from UN Habitat that's shared with our colleagues in the UNISDR, and that is the inextricable link between the need for local governments to integrate risk-based planning and development as a means of protecting development gains uh, at, at urban scales at a, and also at a global scale. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your patience. I'd like to thank our, all of our panelists for their, for their time and for their knowledge. Uh, and uh, I'll close the session here. Uh, just briefly handing over to Mr. Ocampo uh, for a, a closing word. Thank you very much So uh, for your attendance. And please, uh, if you help me to give a, an applause to all of the members of this session, so thank you.